going to the fire. I'd be too late. Way too late. My job is fighting fires before they happen, so they won't happen. Or at worst, so little ones won't get to be big ones. Not much thriller stuff to my kind of firefighting. To see that they follow fire safety rules. Nothing like what could happen if a fire in this yard spread to the tenement houses on the block. Nothing dramatic either in explaining the ABCs of electric fuses to a rooming house landlady who doesn't know an ampere from a broom handle. I meet up with this type every day. Kindly souls, proud of the nice places they run, wouldn't hurt a flea on purpose. Yet I hate to think what might happen if a heavy electric load was put on one of those overfused circuits. And there's nothing spectacular about helping some of our men check on reports of gasoline fumes under the street. Ever see an explosometer at work? What the indicator said was there was a vapor down there, explosive enough to blow part of the street right into that school playground. You can't be too careful where 400 kids are concerned. So I went over to warn the school principal. Having just inspected this school a week before, I was mighty surprised at what happened. Locked out. And much worse, the youngsters locked in. That's what happens when those old-style panic bolts are locked by a chain at night. I hunted up the janitor in a hurry. His story was that the kids aren't supposed to use that door as an entrance, so it's kept locked till school starts. And this morning, he hadn't gotten around to opening it. Later, watching a classroom of kids march out through that doorway, I said a little prayer. Thanks, Lord, that there was no fire in that school this morning. Meanwhile, the men were on the trail of the gasoline vapor. They finally traced it to a leak in a tank at a filling station. The tank has to come out, fast. Naturally, that doesn't make the owner very happy. But have you ever seen a gasoline fire? I have. Well, I guess you'd think most of what I do is pretty routine crawling through old cellars, playing hide-and-seek with the rats to make sure multiple dwelling heating plants are in safe condition. A lot of petty detail stuff like keeping a sharp eye for shaky handrails and loose steps. Climbing a million stairs. At least some days it seems like a million. Checking in once a day on every movie theater in town to make sure that one day they don't get careless and slip up on some item in the fire code. Seeing that people don't park their cars in alleyways where they block fire escapes. Routine? Yeah, it's routine, all right. But someday in that building, there may be a fire. That fire escape may be the only way the people can get out. And the alley may be the only way the firemen can get in. That won't be so routine, mister. No, nobody's going to pin a hero's medal on me. And you can't rescue a beautiful blonde from a house that doesn't burn. But I get kicks out of my work that are better than a medal. Matter of fact, there was a little blonde in one of those families I may have saved this week. Saved from death in an incinerator. You see, last week when I checked on the house she lives in, it would only have taken a carelessly dropped match or a smoldering cigarette to turn the whole building into a flaming furnace. 
I was pretty rough on that landlord when I got him down in the basement to look at his chamber of horrors. Rubbish next to an air shaft that could carry a fire through the whole building in two minutes. Open paint cans, paint-soaked rags, and an open jug of solvent giving off a steady flow of flammable vapors. And a few feet away, a workbench, the floor covered with shavings that would burn like tinder. Wet clothes hanging from electric wire, a neat way to make fire by short circuit. A loose joint in the furnace flue pipe and a hole in the chimney, double danger there. Fire and deadly carbon monoxide gas. Hot ashes near a wooden partition. And maybe worst of all was that pile of junk at the foot of the cellar stairs. If that stuff catches fire, the stairs go up in flames. How do you get down to fight the fire? You don't. I'll say this for that fellow. He took it. Said he hadn't been down there for a year and to give him a week to have it cleaned up. So today I went back to check and I really got a pleasant surprise. What a difference. I hardly knew the place. Shiny new metal cans to hold the rubbish. The paint cans I'd seen lying around open were stored safely in a metal cabinet tops on the cans to keep the vapors in, and a special container for the solvent. The mess around the workbench gone. Clean workbench and clean floor. The wire that the wet clothes had hung from was now enclosed in metal cable. Where the loose flue pipe and chimney hole had been, there were tight, safe seals. The hot furnace ashes had been safely put in metal barrels. At the foot of the stairs, the junk was all gone. So was the mess of trash outside. Little Blondie doesn't know it, but she can sleep better now. And so can the guy her daddy pays rent to. Another spot I hit today was Hans Miller's restaurant. His place is popular for banquets and dances, and Hans has to handle some large crowds. So he's really hipped on fire safety. When I inspect his place, I can just about count on finding everything okay. Extinguishers handy and in good working order. Exit signs where they should be and lighted. And the exits kept clear. Emergency lights all set to be used any time the house current fails. Party decorations made of flame-proof material. You're not likely to find Hans Miller missing any bet that'll make his place safe from fire. But today I did. Just as a matter of routine, I made a burn test on his window drapes. I was as surprised as Hans at what happened. Seemed he just had the drapes cleaned. He didn't know they had to be retreated for flame proofing after every cleaning. Which reminded me once more what a risk it is to skip any part of even a routine inspection. Well, that gives you some idea of how a fire prevention bureau operates. But there's something you folks have to remember. Under the law, my authority is limited to public buildings, factories, and multiple dwellings and rooming houses. When it comes to a private home, your home, I can't just barge in. I have to be invited. And even so, a man's home is his castle, and it's up to the master of the castle to be his own day-to-day -day fire inspector. You know, in every home there's a clock. Every time that clock ticks off 33 seconds, there's a fire somewhere in this country. And one in every three is a fire where people live, where a home may be destroyed, where children may die. Every 33 seconds. And there's scarcely 
every one of these fires where someone doesn't wish bitterly for another chance. A chance to put out a carelessly tossed match or cigarette. A chance to repair a frayed electric cord. chance to undo some other careless cause of a fire that never needed to happen. You still have that chance, though with each passing 33 seconds, the time you have to do it in grows less. The time when fire may strike your family grows closer. Act while you still have time. Clean up the rubbish in your cellar and attic. Get a man to attend to that furnace or stove repair you've been putting off. If you're not sure your chimney is safe from defects, have it checked. Decide on a safe place for those matches where the kids can't reach them. Adopt safe smoking rules. Put all the household electrical equipment in safe repair. Set up a family fire prevention bureau to fight the fire that may destroy your home. To fight it before it happens. So that it won't happen.